thank you all so much for attending this Black Empowerment Works grantee workshop number three, all around designing, delivering, and evaluating programs. We're so happy to bring this session on in partnership with Table and uh, BI3. During our time today, we're going to cover a couple of topics, but I first want to extend a warm welcome to you from our friends, all of us on the Black Empowerment Works team. So you have Jeremiah Pennebaker and Will Simpson. My name is Janae Bradley, and the three of us make up your Black Empowerment Works team at United Way. So if you ever reach out for questions, know it's going to be one of us that answers those for you, and we'll answer those with a lot of joy. But you're not only going to hear from us today, we have our special guest speaker, Taran Stallings with the DAD Initiative and Table. He is going to be the man of the hour talking about our topic of designing, delivering, and evaluating programs. During our session today, we're going to cover two main things. One is a high-level overview of Black Empowerment Works, especially for folks where this may be their first engagement with us in the process. We want to make sure that you have a solid grounding in the work. And the meat and potatoes of our session is going to be that content around designing, delivering, and evaluating programs. We'll cover the tenets of strong program design, considerations for program delivery, and methods of evaluating effectiveness. I want to lift up that the information that we provide today, while it will be applicable to your work in filling out the Black Empowerment Works application and beyond, it also should be generally helpful uh, for all of your grant making desires. So there may be a couple of things that may not fully be required for Black Empowerment Works, but is a great um, strategy to securing other funds beyond us. So let's start with a big, broad vision of United Way. Our United Way is focused on building solutions and aligning systems to help our community thrive. We typically describe that as this iceberg, where at the top we see the symptoms of systems failing. So uh, challenges in accessing education and so forth. But we know that those are because of some root cause issues that we should address, which range from policies and practices to relationships, power, and mental models. In our work, we're addressing both those symptoms while also getting to the root causes in collaboration with folks in our community. In Black Empowerment Works, our grant funding will also align to this sort of area, and we see this as an opportunity for us to evaluate our practices, our relationships in power, and how do we provide resources to community-based Black-led work. We say that the Black-led Social Change Initiative, which is the umbrella that Black Empowerment Works falls under, exists because we are compelled to hold space and provide resources to imagine and bring to life unencumbered, self-determined Black futures. To be clear, it's not our role at United Way to define what an unencumbered, self-determined Black future looks like. We believe in the power of community to do that, but we do see our role as providing space and resources to figure out that answer, at least in our greater Cincinnati community. Black Empowerment Works is described as more than just a grant program. While we certainly do provide access to funds, we also want to engage community members as decision makers. So all of the Black Empowerment Works funding is decided by a panel of community volunteers. We want to provide resources to community-based Black-led work that's building solutions and transforming systems. Those resources include capacity building and beyond. And overall, we want to contribute to this ecosystem of support for Black social change makers. So being a part of Black Empowerment Works provides you that opportunity. Eligibility-wise, the Black Empowerment Works grant program is open to nonprofits, for-profits, social enterprises, community coalitions, and individuals who meet our eligibility requirements, and they are listed on the screen. The first geographic focus means that the work has to happen in our United Way of Greater Cincinnati nine county region, which includes Hamilton, Brown and Claremont counties in Ohio, Dearborn and Ohio counties in Indiana, Boone, Kenton, Campbell and Grant counties in Kentucky. Black leadership and labor means to us that the majority of folks who are empowered to make decisions on behalf of your group identify as black. 
So that's 60% for staff or team. And if your organization has a board of directors, it's 50% for the board of directors. The labor piece means that there's an intentional focus on creating positive outcomes for folks who identify as Black. Though that's not at the exclusion of others, there's an intentional focus. Grassroots and community-based for us means that folks who are impacted by the issue or opportunity that your work centers on are also involved in crafting the solutions. So perhaps that means that you have, as a leader have lived experience in the issue or you're tapping into community members who do. And that sort of engagement is ongoing. Typically, organizations or groups are smaller in structure to be eligible for Black empowerment works. Community benefit is one that we have to lift up every time as a grant program that is also accessible to for-profit organizations. So this is not a traditional small business grant. The work really has to provide a broad community benefit above and beyond what's provided to any individual business or group. So if you find yourself requesting funds solely for, let's say, increasing your access to products, it likely won't be eligible. And our last piece, and one that was lifted up in the questions in advance of this session, was around actionability. We define that as work that is far enough along in development or implementation that it can create measurable results within our grant year. Our grant year runs September to September, so September 2023 to September 2024. This may mean that you have all of the structures of your work in place, but perhaps you haven't implemented it. So long as it is feasible that you can carry out this work within the grant term, it could be eligible for Black Empowerment Works. For us, you can only submit one application per year, and that includes uh, single entity applications and collaboratives. You can learn more about both of those options on our website, uwgc.org slash BEW. Focus area wise, we like to keep this very broad because we know it takes a lot to create a self-determined, unencumbered Black future. So your work will likely touch one or multiple of these areas. In terms of strong applications, we lift up these five qualities, and we'll talk about some of these in, in Taran's section. So a strong application will be clear. So the proposed work is clear, defined, and easy to understand. It'll be feasible, meaning that the budget and timeline are clear and will likely, you'll have enough resources to carry it out, which connects to our next item of capacity. We want it to be clear that with funding and supports, you, you and your organization have sufficient capacity to carry out the work as you've proposed. Impact means that the work is able to produce meaningful and measurable results, again, within the grant year. And eligibility for us means that the work strongly aligns to our criteria and one or multiple of our focus areas. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat about this, but I know that you did not come here to hear from me and general information about the Black Empowerment Works program. You are here for designing, delivering, and evaluating programs. So I'm so excited to welcome our guest, Taran Stallings of the DAD Initiative and with Table. Taran, I want to give you a moment to introduce yourself as I switch my screen share. Let me start by saying good afternoon to everyone. And isn't Janae the perfect voiceover person for BET? Like, God, dog, girl, you do a great job. And it's really hard to talk after you. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Taran Stallings, uh, founder and executive director of the DAD Initiative, uh, co-founder and also co-executive director of Table. Uh, happy to be with you all today. Um, these are a few of my titles probably have too many. Um, but what I'm uh, happy to be with you today to talk about is uh, program design, uh, program delivery, and also evaluating programs. So um, I try to uh, make these pretty succinct uh, so that we can get through all of the topics. I've got a little bit more than my colleagues have had, 
So if I uh, am moving fast, please feel free to let me know in the chat or save those questions for the end. I'm happy to answer any once we're done with the uh, presentation. Uh, Janae, if it's okay, we'll go ahead and dive in for the sake of time, if that's all right. So um, was good. All right. It's a screen. Is a, are the slides changing your, on your end? Uh, we're at the uh, just the the table title screen. Okay, one so second. Let me see what's happening. So you all know if I'm shivering, I'm actually working from a library in Columbus today where I'm actually doing some program design with some some good folks from Columbus in Jacksonville, Florida. So it is pretty cold in this room and I am uh, pretty African-American. So this is not the most conducive weather environment for me. So uh, we may need to turn that Frankie Beverly back on and get me moving and some blood back in my fingertips. All right, looks like we have our first slide. So we'll talk about program design. So let's start by defining what program design actually is. Uh, simply put, program design is the process of planning and creating a program that uh, meets the need of your target audience. So let's uh, identify a, cute, a few key steps involved in the program design process. Um, so if you're taking notes, I would say step one would be identify the problem of need, all right? Start by identifying the problem uh, that your program aims to address. It's important to conduct research ahead of that to ensure that your program meets a genuine need in the community. Um, we don't want to always ideate in isolation. We want to make sure that we're actually tapping in with the people that we intend to serve. Uh, for example, if you are a nonprofit organization that aims to tackle poverty, you might want to research the root causes of poverty in your specific area to determine whether the specific or which specific issues you should go about targeting. So making sure that we identify the problem, but specifically for the community that we intend to serve and lifting their voice, which is something that is absent from a lot of grants and a lot of programs. So again, instructing you all on how to be sufficient and, and efficient at this, always lift community voice. Uh, step two, you wanna set goals and objectives. Um, maybe you've heard of SMART goals, but you know that is what I'm referencing as a best practice. So once you've identified the problem, you wanna set specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound goals and objectives for your program. Give you an example of that, for example, so if your program aims to reduce poverty, your goals and objectives might include increasing the number of people who secure stable employment or improve access to education and training. All right, but you definitely want to follow the SMART goal process. Um, step three, set, uh, determine, I'm sorry, determine program activities and strategies. So based on your goals and objectives, determine the activities and strategies that will help you achieve them. For example, if your program aims to improve access to education and training, you might wanna offer scholarships, job training or career counseling services, all right? Uh, and finally, step four, create a program logic model. This might be a new concept for many of you, but you know what it is should resonate. So a program logic model is a visual representation of your program's goals, objectives, activities, and intended outcomes. So it's valuable when you wanna communicate what your program is to stakeholders, and evaluate the effectiveness of your program. Remember, you're only as good as the story that you can tell. That is a big part of getting funding uh, and continuing funding uh, on the back end. So you definitely wanna make sure you tell the right story and creating a logic model is a way to do so. So the key takeaways from this section, if you're taking notes, research the problem or need your program aims to address, set smart goals and objectives, determine program activities and strategies, and create a program logic model. All right, so our second part of this presentation is program delivery. 
I should have paused. Are there any pressing questions about uh, what was just explained? Or Janae, is there anything that you need to insert? Okay. Nothing on my end. Sounds good. All right, we will move forward to program delivery. Program delivery refers to the process of implementing your program and providing services to your target audience. Few key steps involved in program delivery. So one, identify your needs and hire and train staff. This is uh, pretty difficult for many of us right now in the current environment of trying to capture employees. So you wanna think about this early and often but you wanna hire staff who has the necessary skills and experiences to implement your program effectively. That means that sometimes you can't hire your friends. <laughs> All right, train them on your program's goals, objectives, and activities so that they can deliver services that meet the needs of your target audience. Uh, training, professional development, all of those things are a part of putting your staff in the best possible situation to deliver uh, your content. You want to be very intentional about who you put in front of people because, you know, you're going to sync with them if they're not effective in doing their job. So making sure that they're trained is uh, paramount. Step two, develop partnerships and collaborations. You want to collaborate with organizations and agencies to leverage resources and increase the impact of your program. Example would be if your program aims to reduce homelessness. You might partner with housing agencies, mental health organizations, and community centers. I will say that in the current landscape, what we're experiencing is a lot of funders are very much interested in seeing collaboration, uh, probably more so than I've seen in the past. Uh, this helps with not reproducing the wheel. Uh, also, it helps funders with, um, you know, getting dollars out equitably. So. Where there is opportunity to work together without it being forced, definitely uh, it's always a plus for people to see collaboration. Step three, develop and implement a marketing plan. Develop a marketing plan to promote your program and attract your target audience. Use various marketing strategies such as social media, flyers, press releases, um, news articles, television interviews uh, where possible to try to reach your audience. Uh, again, like I said, with the logic model, uh, the effectiveness of your program hinges on people knowing that it actually exists. So uh, the better you tell your story, uh, the more clientele you get uh, to be participants in your program, and also the more funders know that you're out there doing the good work that you all intend to do. Uh, step four would be monitor and adjust program activities. Uh, sometimes things don't work out the way that uh, we plan them to. And so monitoring comes into place. When you regularly monitor your program and activities and the outcomes, they are able to ensure that they align with your program goals and objectives. You want to adjust your activities as needed to improve effectiveness. Don't stay the course on something if you see it's not working. Now, that's different from uh, giving something the time to work, but if you see that it is not well received or it didn't uh, manifest the way you planned, it is okay to change course, and most funders will understand that. You just want to be able to communicate with uh, whoever is providing the funding, um, uh, what concerns you may have that are leading to the change, and nine times out of ten, they'll be okay with you adjusting because, again, the, uh, the goal is to serve the community, right? And so we wanna put ourselves in the best situation to do that. Um, so for this section, key takeaways, you wanna hire and train staff, develop partnerships and collaborations, develop and implement marketing strategies and plans, uh, monitor and adjust program activities. I'll insert a couple of things here to build on what you're saying from a Black Empowerment Works perspective. So Please. one, I want to lift up that from a Black Empowerment Works standpoint, you do have the ability in your request to include staff time. So if you need to bring people on uh, and if you need to pay them, include that in your request. 
in terms of developing partnerships and collaborations, while partnerships are not required in order to apply for funding, they are certainly uh, encouraged, especially as we think about that element of a strong application being capacity. We know our grant funds are like $40,000 and your idea might be bigger than $40,000. So having people that you can work with closely only helps. I love the fact, Tran, that you lifted up developing and implementing a marketing plan. From a timeline perspective, be sure to include the time that you need to ramp up your work into your timeline. Sometimes folks forget to, to elevate that and then their timeline is immediately off course as soon as they submit it. And yes, to everything Tran said around monitoring, adjusting, program activities, we try to be a really flexible funder uh, that allows for adjustments along the way, but still certainly put together uh, a timeline that you think is feasible from the start. Thanks, Tran. Thank you, Janae. Uh, and to that last point, you know, you definitely want to be mindful on the front end. Um, it's always better when, you know, you spend the time to plan things out um, and it works out. So a lot of times you can ensure that just through what I mentioned earlier in terms of research and the thought partnership that comes along with uh, collaboration and leveraging other people's expertise. Uh, so what we don't need to reinvent uh, and where there is existing research, you want to lean into that, uh, not only from a time standpoint, but also uh, from a monetary standpoint. It costs money to do evaluations and run focus groups and all the things that need to happen sometimes. Uh, but if the data is already existing and you're you're thoughtful about going out and looking for that data, it puts you in a situation where you're able to hold on to the funds that, you know, you would have to allocate uh, to get that type of research. All right. So moving on, uh, our last topic is program evaluation. So what is program evaluation? Uh, the process of assessing your program's effectiveness in achieving its goals and objectives. So let's, uh, let's get into step one, identifying evaluation questions. So identifying evaluation questions that align with your program's goals and objectives is key. For example, if your program aims to reduce poverty, your evaluation questions might include, how many people secured stable employment as a result of your program? Or what were the barriers to securing employment for our target or for your target audience? Uh, you want to be thoughtful here. You want to be thoughtful uh, with how you are collecting data and the questions that you're asking drive that. Um, so this, you know, is another good place to lean into thought partnership, to talk to community, uh, and really key in on what it is that you're trying to do so that these questions are properly aligned. All right, step two, choose evaluation methods. Now, there are tons of ways to evaluate data. Um, few of them that I will lift up. Um, surveys, I mean, we're all familiar with what a survey is. Uh, interviews are some of my favorite uh, because you get uh, some intangible things out of interviewing people, qualitative interviewing is, is one of the key things that we do. And that is getting people either recorded or on camera um, so you can evaluate what they have to say about your programs, but also you're able to read body language. This is uh, particularly effective in pre and post. So I should say with your evaluations, uh, you definitely want to set these up to have pre-assessment and post-assessment at minimum. Um, Oftentimes, we will assess throughout the program to, again, be able to measure effectiveness, uh, but interviewing is, is, is definitely one of our favorite. Uh, focus groups are also effective. Um, many of you may have been called into a focus group at some point in your career uh, where you collectively uh, have discussion around some of these, uh, these questions uh, pertaining to your program. Uh, observations you know, should be a part of, of any good program uh, evaluation. You want to actually show up and see the program work. It's one thing to, to write it up. It's another thing to observe it and see if it's actually being effective for yourself. Uh, a lot of times we put employees in place and let them run with a program and 
if we don't put eyes on it, uh, you are, run the risk of defaulting sometimes to a bad employee or somebody who's not properly trained. So you definitely want to go out and see your programs work if you're not uh, the person is doing direct implementation. Uh, then finally, data analysis. Um, oftentimes, this requires you to go out and find somebody who has that skill set. Um, sometimes we have programs where we're able to analyze the data, but oftentimes we bring in a third party to make sure that we have a uh, objective view of the way things roll out. So, um, yeah, those are key steps in evaluation. Uh, then step three. Uh, collecting and analyzing data. Let's let's get into that a little bit deeper. So uh, collecting data, using your chosen evaluation methods, um, you want to analyze the data to answer your evaluation questions. Uh, again, this could be you, this could be a third party. Uh, use that data to identify strengths and weaknesses of your program and to make recommendations for how you will improve your program. All right. Uh, then you want to move on to report finding and making improvements to your program. So report your evaluation findings to your stakeholders. Again, you know, the way you tell your story is, is key to securing funding and securing interest. Um, use the recommendations uh, that maybe they make or staff makes or community uh, stakeholders make or the uh, program participants make to uh, drive the improvements to your program. Uh, regularly conduct evaluations to ensure that the program is meeting its key goals and objectives. Uh, regularly is up to you. I mean, you need to determine that uh, with your, you know, collaborators or with your staff, with your evaluator, uh, ideally, on how often you need to uh, evaluate your program's effectiveness. And that's going to vary depending on what type of project endeavor you take on. Uh, for this section, key takeaways, identify evaluation questions, choose evaluation methods, collect and analyze data, report findings, and make improvements. Um, and before we open up for more questions, I have a couple of examples. So example one, you have a nonprofit organization that wants to address the issue of food insecurity in their community. They conducted research and identified that many low-income families do not have access to healthy food. Their program goals and objectives are to increase access to healthy food, provide nutrition, education, and reduce food waste. They partnered with local grocery stores and food banks to provide healthy food options to low-income families. They also provided nutrition education, uh, and held cooking demonstrations to teach families how to prepare healthy meals. They evaluated their program by conducting surveys and focus groups with the program participants. They found that 80% of participants reported an increase in access to healthy food and 90% reported an increase in nutrition knowledge. All right, so this is how all of these things tie together and play out. Uh, I'll give you one more example and then we'll uh, open it up. So example two, nonprofit organization B wants to address the issues of youth mental health in their community. They conducted research and identified that many youth struggle with anxiety and depression. Their program goals and objectives are to provide mental health counseling and support services to youth. They partner with a local mental health agency to provide consult, uh, counseling services and help support group meetings for youth. They evaluated their program by conducting pre and post program surveys with program participants. They found that 70% of participants reported a decrease in symptoms of anxiety and depression and 80% reported an increase in social support. So from here, key takeaways, research the problem or need your program aims to address, develop partnership and collaboration, use various evaluation methods to evaluate uh, program outcomes. Uh, last thing, regularly conduct evaluations. All right. So those are the keys I see as I see it for program evaluation. And uh, at this point, I definitely want to open it up 
if there are any questions or allow Janae to insert if she has any. We have a question in the chat from Jessica, which reads, is there a recommendation to conduct the interview under the organization or third party? Um, I, it's at your discretion. Um, if, if you have the capacity to conduct those interviews, uh, capacity meaning manpower, capacity meaning financial resources, um, then I think it's perfectly fine to do that in-house. Um, or I'm sorry, with a third party. Um, so it, it really just depends on your organizational capacity. I will say that, you know, be realistic with the budget that you have. And if your budget is, is not one that allows you to uh, hire a third party, it's perfectly acceptable for somebody within the organization to conduct those interviews as those questions should have been predetermined and well thought out. Building on that, I think it's important, uh, and of course you've lifted this up, to be really clear around the questions and ensure that they're shaped in a way that doesn't lead people to the specific answer that you're looking for. Yeah. So an example, if you're wondering if uh, people are finding the programming to provide value to their lives, that's a really broad evaluation metric and one you likely shouldn't use, but in that scenario, a challenging way or a leading way to frame that question would be, tell me what you think is valuable about our program and that being the only evaluative question that you're asking, because that's assuming that people already find value in what you're providing. So as you're shaping those questions and if you're conducting those interviews, just make sure that they're framed in a way as neutral as possible and that gives you usable information for your organization. You also want to consider who's conducting that interview uh, and what the relationship is between that person and the person being interviewed. We want to make sure that it doesn't create uh, a conflict or tension where folks aren't necessarily giving you the most honest answers, because there's a lot of learning that can be had by asking really great questions. Are there other questions from folks? in the audience, and you can feel free to come off of mute to ask them. Janae, may I ask a follow-up question to that? Sure. Response? Um, this is Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in follow-up to that, does Black Empowerment Works or United Way offer that as a resource to grantees um, to evaluate their program participants? as a the, neutral third party? Mm, that's um, such a great question. And it is not a service that we offer. One reason being, uh, we also don't want to get in your business like that, right? We want to lean into a space of trust. And if we start to evaluate your work, I don't think that, that lifts up that tenant of trust. Uh, but perhaps, Taran, do you know any groups that might do that evaluative third party interviewing? Um, let, uh, let's say this, how about we, uh, we get a list of some folks together and we send it to you all. Um, you know, it's, it's not a very lengthy list, uh, because we would definitely want you considering the direction of many of your grants to have cultural competency be a part of that process. And so let us spend some time with some vetted organizations and I'll provide that, uh, that those recommendations to Janae. Thank you, Taran. Thank you. Other questions from folks on this piece? Hello, uh, how everybody doing? Uh, Hello. This is Andre, uh, back again. Uh, so was Ryan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, listen, you had a really good point I was thinking about in the terms of like marketing because I, I appreciate y'all saying, like, make sure that the uh, marketing is included in that. It, when we think of terms of marketing, are we talking about, like, um, trying to, like, go to a certain space of, like, kind of pushing beyond? Because I kind of feel like that's, I, I thought that was interesting in this space, because I'm not confident. I've seen a lot of marketing, like, you know what I'm saying, hardcore. So, are we, so could you, like, maybe go a little bit more depth in that, what you, what you think would be good marketing for a program? Again, um, I would think that the marketing, again, is, is tied to your budget, you know, what you can afford. Again, I, I encourage nobody to try to supersede their budget 
to do marketing. There's a lot of ways to do it. And that could be simply sending somebody out into the community to have conversations on your behalf if there's not a budget for you to buy billboards. Uh, when your organization is at that level, like there was a point in time where the Dad Initiative purchased billboards during Black History Month to uh, lift up a particular theme, but also as a precursor to our uh, Black Futures program that we have at TQL. Um, but it took a while for our organization to be able to handle that type of expense. Um, social media marketing is fairly cheap. Uh, you can buy an ad on Facebook and Instagram. And quite honestly, that's where a lot of our clientele is spending time. So uh, 20 bucks will take you a long way. Um, but again, just um, understanding your audience, where your audience lives, um, and making sure that you are present in those spaces is how I would think about marketing. And, you know, again, considering your budget, you'll figure out the best way to engage. The only build out add to that is consider the size of your work as you consider the size of your marketing plan. So it might not be advantageous to do a big splashy approach to marketing if your work is able to accept 10 folks, right? Because then you're just going to be inundated with people who won't be able to access what you're offering. So everything Taran said, plus how do you make sure that the scale of your marketing matches the scale of your work? Big appreciate. My pleasure. These are really great questions. They are. <laughs> for a minute, I thought I was just so clear that nobody had any. So thanks for humbling me. <laughs> <laughs> do have a question for you, Taran, if you feel so comfortable in sharing. Uh, do you have an example of a time where you had to pivot your work based off of trends happening in community? <laughs> How about COVID? <laughs> That's probably the biggest pivot our organization has, has had thus far, going from in-person work to uh, the world stopping and us developing um, our online curriculum uh, actually faster than the school district did. Um, so that's that's one example. Um, I will say another good example is just the extension of our work. Um, though some of you may know dad's work uh, started with mentorship um, and we now have a pretty robust workforce pipeline. Uh, we're teaching kids tech and manufacturing and drones and all of these things out of uh, an understanding of what our community is calling for in terms of workforce need. Um, so we're trying to put Black kids in a position to be able to go into the jobs that are now and, and, and will be the future uh, was a big pivot for us, you know, growing from, hey, let's just, you know, try to feed into their social and emotional needs to you know let's let's also address their their parents needs so that the parents can show up the way they need to for their child to actually be able to grow up uh in a in an in a effective way so um plenty of pivots along the road for us those are a few uh call outs that i can throw out quickly sort of connected to that you talked a lot about uh, making sure that you're able to evaluate your work for a small or a newer organization, what are some great ways or platforms to capture your outcomes, especially over time? Sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a huge fan of video. Um, I think it's, it serves a dual role. Uh, a, it could be a great marketing tool. So as you talk about marketing your program, uh, nothing lives better than a testimonial from somebody who's actually experienced your services. Um, and the way that things show up uh, on camera can sometimes be more telling than an actual report. Um, so, you know, I love qualitative interviewing, uh, but also, you know, many people are fans of numbers, right? So being able to, again, had a foresight to design your evaluations to be um, inclusive of all of these key points, you know, and, and this is this comes with understanding who your funders are also and what's important to them. Obviously, you want the main thing to be what's important to you and your organization, but also if you want to maintain uh, financial resources from a funder, you have to consider what's important to them. So uh, understanding what what those things are. And, and designing your evaluation to consider all of those things are, are pretty key. 
on the quantitative side, I've heard folks use platforms like Airtable, uh, a good old fashioned Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I would strongly encourage you not to like have things on paper and pencil. Like it's just a pain in the butt to try to keep track of it. Are there other platforms or strategies beyond Airtable and Excel that you feel like are really helpful for organizations or groups in tracking their data? Yeah, I track mine on napkins, to be honest with you, uh, because the United, no, I'm split. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, Excel works. There's a lot of, uh, of platforms. We don't have a favorite. Uh, we, we default to Excel a lot. And a lot of our funders actually, you know, create evaluation tools that we're able to populate. So uh, we defer a lot of times to what the funders request are before our own internal uh, uh, audits and, and, and evaluations. Uh, a lot of stuff is is still Excel for us, um, probably because my hair is turning gray and I'm not learning much new. You can do some pretty impressive data modeling in Excel, should your heart feel so inclined to do so. So we're not going to shade a good old fashioned Excel spreadsheet and collecting data. And it's, a, it's not a monthly bill. It is not a monthly bill. That is absolutely true. And so again, being being mindful of, uh, you know, the size of these grants, and I'm not sure if you guys are going after this solely or if you're pairing this uh, Black Empowerment grant with others, but again, uh, the capacity of these grants to serve a whole lot, um, you know, you want to be mindful of how you're spending those resources and making sure that the program is actually able to be implemented. So you got to be a good steward of your funds. And I'm going to pass it over to Brandon to ask his question, but I want to lift up that in Black Empowerment Works, we have a, a statement that we do not expect Harriet Tubman level work for $25,000 or $40,000. So again, make sure you're shaping that work in a way that seems realistic or feasible based on the size of the grant. Brandon, the floor is yours for your question. All righty, I appreciate it. I'm in my, I'm in my truck, so sorry about the background, I'm kind of on the move. But um, I had a friend that uh, has a company that we kind of partner with called Raising a Black Voice. Now she does a lot of work uh, with locals in the community, in the surrounding community, but she also does work in Africa as well, um, which I find like super extraordinary. Um, but however, I know that this grant is regional. Um, so when she's kind of going through the program, would you recommend her um, focusing more on what they do in the community and not really talking about what uh, she does in Africa or can we include that, but just understand that the money that is, you know, granted is not, you know, for that. It's for community work within the community. You yes. hit the nail on the head with your second answer. So certainly we don't want you to not talk about the full scope of your program, but recognizing that this grant fund is regional in focus, there should be a lot of content yeah. around that piece, especially as you look at the timeline and the measures of success. All right, thank you, thank you. I just wanted some clarification so I could better approach and help her with any questions she might have. Thank you. Yeah, anything you'd add to that, Taran? You know, I think that's spot on. Um, I think your budget, your budget will demonstrate a lot of that. And so if you have a clear budget or you utilize a budget narrative, you can call out the full scope of work, but so specifically where the, uh, the funders dollars will be utilized. And as long as you can illustrate that, I think it's great to draw the uh, full scope of your work. Okay. Appreciate that. Good brother. How are you doing too? Also, but <laughs> I'm well, man. Good to see you, man. Always, brother. That a lot of our our fellowship information sessions, man. Always uh, good to have you contribute, good brother. Yes, sir, man. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Feel free to keep the amazing questions going. Hey, everybody. Okay, one more again. Go ahead. This is I'm sorry. Um, well, hello, my name is Ishara Gooden. Um, I'm partnering with Brandon. So um, I'm actually the one, the friend that he's speaking of. Um, and so far, I believe all of my questions have been answered, especially the last one. 
um, with just, you know, focusing on where the funding would, um, you know, happen within our region. Um, but I did just want to get on and just say hello. Appreciate everything that's been covered so far. Absolutely. Good to meet you, sister. And uh, congratulations on the amazing uh, work that's happening overseas. That's, that's, that's is amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. What's happening there, right? One more again. All right. So, so, so listen to this big, right? I've been, you know what I'm saying? I'm new to, to at Tino, I'm not new to the work, but I'm new to trying to do this part. I mean, I, I, I was thinking about it. I wouldn't go ask a question on the recording, but somebody else might benefit from this question. And I'm going gonna, gonna to bravely go ahead and just ask this question. How do we, and what are we supposed to do in the terms of writing out the grant? Mm. How it, it don't feel right trying to pay myself, but I was encouraged to, that's supposed to be a thing. I don't even know where else to go with that. Like, I just don't know how. I got it. All right. I'm trying to hold <laughs> me down. All right. So uh, I have foolishly made that mistake in the past, right? Um, and, and even now, I do not pay myself what I should pay myself. But it is unrealistic for you to say you're going to do 40 hours of work a week and not have a salary for yourself. That's not even believable, nor is it fair to you, fair to your family, fair to anybody, right? Charity starts at home. You have to prioritize yourself, make sure that you and your family are gonna be able to be good before you can be even remotely able to lean into trying to serve the community. It is tedious work. It is unforgiving work um, and you know, often thankless. Uh, so the least you can do is make sure that you can put food on the table. So absolutely write something in uh, for yourself, man. Again, it can't be the entire grant, <laughs> right? So if they're giving you 40,000, then unfortunately you're not going to make 40,000, but do something realistic. Uh, but definitely t make sure you pay yourself, man. Agreed. I have uh, lovingly yelled at some folks of like, I don't know why you are not paying yourself in this grant. So I appreciate you for lifting up that question. Uh, from our perspective, right, it is impossible to think that it doesn't take people to carry out work. And we honor that. And sometimes you'll find other grants that are very narrowly focused on program delivery, and that may not allow you to pay yourself. So include that here. If you have other grants that are covering the cost of parts of your programming in your budget, make sure to lift that up. Next week, this time next week, we'll have a session all on building a budget that works. So we encourage you to attend that. Additionally, our past two sessions is your work grant ready and a deep dive into the application. Uh, those recordings are available on the website. So we, in each of those, at least briefly touch on, please pay yourself. It is chaotic not to. All right, man. Appreciate y'all, man. Uh, come up with a support group for people trying to figure out how to do this, man. It'd be hard. The idea of paying yourself out of this stuff because you're thinking about the work you're trying to create. So, you know, appreciate y'all. Of course. I have a question. Hello, my name is Shonda Dawson. How are, hi, everybody. I just wanted to know, do you guys um, offer resources um, that provide information on individuals that are able to assist with actually filling out the application. This is my first time um, even trying to do something like this. So I didn't know if there were um, programs available or businesses out there that actually help individual organizations actually do the whole process. Go for it, Janae. <laughs> I'll start off and you may have a build. So one thing that we do through the Black Empowerment Works program is aim to be super accessible. So you have the ability to schedule question sessions should you have questions along the way. And if you complete your application at least two weeks prior to the deadline, uh, you have the ability to request a preliminary review, meaning we will look through the application that you've crafted and lift up high level questions that the reviewers will likely ask in evaluating. If you would ever 
want that preliminary application review, again, you can request that up until two weeks prior to the deadline. Uh, you would just need to send an email. In terms of folks writing the grant application or providing more direct support, we don't do that because that would create a kind of funky conflict for us, even though community members make the investment decisions. Taran, do you have resources that might be helpful in folks doing that and recognizing that no grant writer is going to say, we can guarantee or shouldn't say, we can guarantee that you'll get funded through this, my resources. Yeah, are you talking about paid resources or free resources? Either. Okay. Um, there, there are organizations like Spark Philanthropy and a few others that can help assist with writing grants. Uh, there may even be some people who are involved with TABLE that would be willing to lean in, but those are fee-for-service type situations. So what I would lift up that may be an untraditional route, it won't help you immediately, but maybe for grants moving forward, is if you have not worked at another or with another nonprofit organization uh, to experience what the work looks like and what grant applications look like, lean in. Like there's way too many <laughs> nonprofit organizations right now, um, but they're definitely starving for help. So, you know, not unlike an internship opportunity that you would take in a for-profit situation, if there is a learning that you'd like to get on the nonprofit side, I'd encourage you to volunteer in that capacity uh, at an existing nonprofit and just try to glean some knowledge from that. Um, you know, I'm sure that through volunteerism, people would be more open to sharing and, and kind of guiding you. So uh, again, not super helpful for a grant that's due in a couple of weeks, but you know, if this one doesn't come to fruition or there are others that are of interest to you in the future, I would look at organizations where you could spend some time learning. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I was, I was gonna piggyback on that if that's all right. I know- uh, You'll be our last question. Oh uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't even a question. I was gonna kind of, maybe provide a little bit of help. I'm not trying to plug nobody or nothing. This is just literally what I've seen on Facebook. I know my guy, DeVoe Sherman, uh, with Sherman Consulting. If you you can look into him, but then also with, uh, when I just typed in nonprofit on Eventbrite, of course, it's like 100, 100 people that have grant writing. Um, like you said, pay, pay for services. Um, people that, you know, now I don't know personally, but they claim to have already gotten so many thousands of dollars scholarships for other nonprofits. If you're really trying to go that route, I know me personally, I, I kind of want to go through the experience and also kind of see and, and do it myself. So that way you can avoid having to pay for it again in the future and possibly get that confidence. Now that's, just, again, that's just, that's just the approach that I'm coming from for it. But I also thought about too paying for outside service. So you know, that's just my little two cents. If it's worth anything. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. All right, we'll create some space for last minute comments, but I wanted to make sure that I touched on this piece. So again, thank you all for attending this session. We do have uh, resources available to you after this. So again, we have those Black Empowerment Works workshops. Our next and last one in the series is around building a budget that works, but you can find the other three, in, including this one soon, uh, those recordings on our website. You have the ability to schedule an unlimited number of question sessions. Those are 30 minute virtual meetings where we can discuss the questions that you have. If you have a quicker or a shorter question that may not merit a full 30 minutes, feel free to send us an email at black-led at uwgc.org or give us a phone call at 513-762-7233. Both that email box and that phone number go to all three of us on the Black Empowerment Works team. So the likelihood that someone will be able to answer your question in a timely fashion is pretty high. If we don't answer the phone, please leave a voicemail and we'll get back to you within 24 hours. Lastly, we do have that pre-submission review, again, to get a preliminary scan of your application for basic recommendations. Thank you all so much for attending this session. Feel free to reach out to us with any other questions along your Black Empowerment Works journey. <laughs>